I'm sure that many of you watching this video may have heard the term exposed to the right. What we're looking at here is a thumbnail that fits that description. But what I'm seeing is that I have the optimum exposure here for any manipulation I care to make. Exposing to the right refers to the fact that we're not driven to get the thumbnail picture looking perfect on the back of the camera, but rather to squeeze as much light into the sensor as we possibly can. Exposed to the right, capture an image that is better placed for manipulation. When I first heard the term exposed to the right, I didn't understand what it was. I did the usual Google search and then realised I'd been exposing to the right for almost as many years as I'd had a digital camera. The reason is, is that we can always darken and reduce tones in our images, but we can't very easily go the other way nearly so well. So those digital photographers who underexpose images a little to avoid losing highlights may not be following the best course. One false move, of course, and you can go too far and then struggle with photographic quality. So when I shot this picture, I was less concerned with how the image looked on the LCD on the back of the camera. I was more concerned about squeezing as much light into the sensor as I could, but without going too far. Look at how the highlights on the basic raw file are just being clipped a tiny amount, but nothing we cannot redeem, and you can just about see them on the woodwork here. If I raise my exposure a little bit, it will make them a little bit more obvious. This tiny amount of clipping warning is actually telling me that I've done what I set out to do. I've squeezed the maximum light into the image, and now I'm perfectly placed to take this forward to almost any manipulation that I want. So taken in Scotland a few years ago, the colour here isn't doing anything for the image. The old remains of the woodwork are just crying out for a monochrome approach. So let's make a start. Let me begin by double clicking the slider and setting it back to where it started from. Remember any of the sliders that we use in Camera Raw, if ever we get lost we can always reset if you touch the ALT key, look, the button in the middle, the cancel button, changes to a reset. We also have the opportunity top right here to reset camera raw defaults, but if we've just moved one or two sliders and we want to drop them back to where we started, just double click them and they'll jump back. Now I think the best place to start here is dealing with the fact that I seem to have one leg in a hole when I took this picture because I do have a fair little tilt to the horizon that you can just see over in this area here so I think I'm going to deal with that to start with now in fact I've just had a thought let's leave the straightening of the horizon until we get this image open into Photoshop and we can take a look at content aware cropping so a familiar place to me is my lens corrections and to remove chromatic aberration and I'm going to remove the saturation. Now I suppose we've got a number of choices here. We can use the system I've demonstrated earlier on where we open up a number of smart objects or we can use the tools solely within Adobe Camera Raw. As I've probably said a number of times, there's no rights and wrongs to this. Use whatever you feel comfortable with. So I'm going to make the start here and look at pushing up the clarity. Now I want to put quite a bit of power into the sky, which means I've got to tone this down quite a lot and we can see what happens when I do that. I would like to just lift maybe the shadows just a touch so they're not too dark and that in turn may mean that I'm going to drop the exposure and it's strange that we tend to think of shadows and blacks we see the slider that looks much the same but they do control different areas so sometimes you can increase the shadows but still drop the blacks down at times I found the need to do that and I'm looking at the histogram at the top of the screen there 
just looking at that little hint of red that's coming in around here. Now I don't think that's too bad, I'm just going to have a few seconds to sit there and look at this picture. The foreground is rather unbalanced isn't it? We've got the dark area on the right and we've got the light area on the left. I'm certainly going to darken down the light area on the left just looking at the right hand side and wondering if I need to lift that a bit but probably not, the tones don't look too bad at all. Now I think I'm going to just increase the exposure a little bit overall and I'm going to work with a multiple smart object in Photoshop. I'm just going to push this up a little bit just to give more sparkle in my black and white and I'm not too concerned for all the reasons we've already talked about about those little red splodges that are appearing in the sky and on the woodwork. I'm looking at the middle distance here I'm trying to get the majority of the picture looking as a sparkling monochrome as I can get. And as the more I look at it, the more I keep fiddling. It's um, just the way of the world, I suppose. But I'm going to open this up into Photoshop. As soon as the image opens up, I want to go straight back into Camera Raw, but I want to go back in with a different version to this one. So I'm going to go to the right of the thumbnail, right click, make a new smart object via a copy, and I'm going to open up the one below, doesn't really matter which one, double click, open that back up into Camera Raw. Now what I want to do now is to concentrate on that foreground bottom left, highlights are not doing a great deal with that, whites takes it down a bit but I guess exposure will be the most that's the most change I think I am willing to impart in that bottom left corner. But whenever we do this sort of work, we're never absolutely certain until we see the two layers put together. But because we're working with smart objects, that's no great problem really. Going back into my layers, I'm going to select the top layer and apply the mask because now I just want to apply those tones in the bottom corner. What I'll do is pick up black as my foreground color a soft edge brush. The brushes I use for most of my photography are the basic brushes. So if you ever lose the basic brushes, just go to your brush option, go to the little cogwheel, and you can choose any of the brushes you wish. There are the basic brushes there. When I select them, if I click append, I'll add the basic brushes to whatever brushes may already be there. So if you need two sets, you can click append. But if you want to switch them around, and I've already got the basic brushes, but I'll hit OK. OK will replace the brushes that are there with the basic ones. And we can pick up our soft edge brush. And as you know, if I put it in the sky, we can increase the size using the square brackets to the right of the letter P. And we can adjust the flow rate of the tool if we just click this little spray icon here. So 5% is a good place to start and I'm just sweeping my brush in here. I'm probably a bit on the low side. I could probably get away with 10%, so I've hit the number one key to adjust that. But I'm just now going to bring through the tones there that I think are appropriate. Dropping down the size of the brush, I'll use them a little bit over here as well, just to sort of darken that area a bit. Always trying to stop us from leeching out of the edge of the frame by having highlights which draw your attention. Now I've just saved the two layers I have in the layers palette as a Photoshop file giving it the file name as normal and 001. I'm going to hold my Alt key, go to the top right of the layers and choose Merge Visible. Photoshop will take the two layers we've been working on and place them together in one layer because I want to take one of these back into Camera Raw and concentrate more on the sky. So I'll turn the middle one off and I'll select the bottom one, double click to open that back up into Camera Raw. So now I'm going to push as much power into the sky as I feel I can get. So looking at this, it's probably not going to be a great deal more, I guess. Let's see if we can push the contrast up a bit. Let's bring the whites up a little bit. 
Now I've got the clipping warning checked up there, so if I go too far you can see what's going to happen. So I need to come back to about there. We'll deepen the shadows, maybe drop the exposure a little bit. And just to hold things in nicely at the top, maybe just a little graduated filter in at the top. Remember these filters will always remember the last setting. So while I'm within the filter, right click, reset it. Now I can touch the V key to lose that selection and I can just drop the exposure down. You can just see what I'm doing in that top corner. Now one of the things I should be doing before we move on is to look at dust marks in the sky because I can see the sun already. So I'm going to pick up my zoom and zoom in here. Now there you can see we've got a few problems here. Let me get that large. I'm going to pick up my healing brush here and I'm going to tick the box down at the bottom of the palette to visualize the spots and sure enough there they are as bold as brass looking like little donuts so I'm going to click each one in turn and fix them. Now again I've got so much confidence in Photoshop fixing these things that I very rarely check the result. Um, obviously I have a look around the image once it's complete but I found that I can rely on it so well that I tend to do so without too much thought these days. Holding the space bar, click and drag, we can move along. We can see all the little donuts. I think that's another one there. Don't rely on this completely. There are always going to be the odd times where you think you've cleared everything by looking at the picture in this way. But when you actually get it open in Photoshop and you zoom in to about 100%, and have a look around you can be surprised sometimes at what you find so that looks okay let's hit control zero I'm gonna open that up into Photoshop and see how we go with that back into the layers once again let's drag this up a little bit no real need to do that but we'll just tuck this one down there out of the way select the top layer and apply the mask because now we need to mask that sky. We can try the gradient tool. We've got the linear gradient selected from the top left of the screen and foreground to transparent from the drop down menu to the left. So if I click and drag, I'm just trying to mirror, if I can, the slope of the hills and you can see that looks pretty good. I'm quite happy with all the tones around here but now I'm finding myself a little bit less than happy with that bottom left corner. But I've got more tones in the image we've just manipulated and I think I'm going to use this layer to bring through a little bit more darkness in that bottom left corner. And I think this is really symbolizing why we have to almost think on our feet and follow our nose when we start these manipulations because it's not until we see the things coming together that one part influences another sometimes positively sometimes not so positively and here I think we need to do something about that so make sure we've got our layer selected but before I start doing any work on that here's another good tip that I've said dozens of times now no concerns whatsoever so black's my foreground color I'll pick up that soft edge brush once again make it a bit bigger in fact I think I'll just drop the size of my image down a little bit so I can come in from the corner looking up at the flow rate at the top of the screen in the options I will drop it down to 5% by hitting 05 and I'm going to start to take that bottom down a bit more and this time I'm not going to be too tempted to push it up because I want to just do it gradually. I notice we had a little bit of lightness there so I'll just push my brush over there too. Maybe even down that little highlight. Attention to detail is what I always think pays dividends here. And right in the corner perhaps I'll go to 10% just to darken that edge. I still think it might need a bit more, you know. 
Okay, let's live with that for the moment. Ooh, went too far there. So I'm going to hit the X key, which switches the black to the white, and I'm just going to take that away. Switch back to the black, drop to 5%, and just sweep my brush just once or twice over there, looking at the picture every time I do it, so I don't overdo it. Okay, I think we need a timeout. Now I think I'd like to go back to my layers here. I'm going to do the same as I did a few moments ago. I'm going to hold the Alt key, click at the top right and choose Merge Visible. Once again, Photoshop has taken those two smart objects and, well, one smart object and one amalgamated object and join them together. Because what I'd like to do now, let's turn these off. Let's bring this one up into play. In fact, I won't need that for the moment. What I want to do here is to bring through some highlights in the background. I'm thinking of the snow a little bit on the background there, maybe these areas here. And anything else I think I just want to lift to make the contrast a wee bit wider. don't think I'm going to get too much, but let's have a look by double-clicking the smart object. I think we could do with a fair bit of contrast. Let's drop the exposure just a touch, although I don't think those little red marks are going to affect us in any way. Maybe not. Let's bring them up again. I'm not going to be doing any work in those areas. It's this area and along here I was thinking of. So let me click OK to open that up. And as soon as it does, we'll add a mask on the top. Now I'm going to zoom in and have a look at what I can do here. So going in rather tight, I'm going to take a bit of care here because the last thing we want is a halo showing around these mountains. So I've got black, I've got my soft brush, I've got my flow rate, might even take it down less than 5%. And I'm just going to do a bit of work on these mountains. Now this is delicate stuff, not difficult, just delicate and you need to be careful. Make the brush bigger or smaller and make the image bigger if you need it. But you can see what I'm doing. I'm just adding a little bit more or bringing through the lighter tones from the mountain. It's a temptation when you're doing this to push the flow rate up. I think I can possibly get away with a bit more, so perhaps I'll risk 5% in the interest of speed. But sometimes it's not a good idea to do that. A little bit on this mountain here. Of course, it doesn't matter, does it, if we make a blatant mistake, because all we do is switch to white, and we can repair anything we get wrong. But we tend to try to get the thing right first go, so we speed up the manipulation process. And all I'm doing is just giving that little extra tweak to the highlights, just to try to increase the impact and appeal of the image. I'm stretching the tones if you like. I always, Sometimes you think of these sorts of things of almost like a manual HDR isn't it? But without the downsides of, downsides of making a HDR image. So that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to move on to... I've got nothing up here I don't think. No, I think I'm going to go back down here to this tree line, maybe even the reflection too. Let's use an up and down movement here, it seems sensible to do that, a little bit down there as well. And that flow rate of 5% is just nice. It enables me, or it means I've got to go over the area a number of times with my brush to get the effect I want. But that's good because it has the effect of tempering what I'm doing. It, if we push the flow rate up too much, the brush runs away with us, and that's where the manipulation we've done is then easily seen on the image we're presenting. Now, I don't particularly want to go too near the edge here. Let's hit Control 0 and you can see just what a difference that little lightness in the background has made. It has helped. Now I'm just looking at this upright post. Is there anything on there I want to bring through? You see I can just lift it a little bit if I want to. 
Now, I wonder how many people are sitting watching this saying, well, he's hardly making any change at all. But it's subtle, but it is a change. This one here I've already darkened a bit, so I think that's light enough. There was something over here that I thought I might just take a look at, just down the edge there. And maybe, not sure it needs it, but let's have a look. Control zero. No, I think the reflection is, is pretty good there. There's a couple of little marks I'd like to deal with around the picture, but I think we'll deal with those in Photoshop. So, just before I open this up, I've done a little bit of extra work, so maybe we'll make another save. And now, shouldn't have said open up, what I meant to say was I'm going to go down and amalgamate all of these together, knowing I've got everything safe. First thing, Control L to bring up the levels. Looks pretty good, but maybe. Have I got a little sparkle there I can bring in without doing any damage? Tick the preview. Again, not very much, but I'll have it. Thank you very much. Now, I think before we go any further, I will fix up some of the little distractions in the image. There's not many of those, but down the bottom right. Not too keen on these rocks here being quite so bright. So I think what we'll do, I'm going to try my content aware. Perhaps I've gone a little bit too big there. It's this one really, but to some degree all of that lot along there. So making that selection, remember I've got my image here as a locked background layer. So rather than going to the edit menu and choosing fill, I can hit delete and enter. Control D, that's pretty good isn't it? Let's pick up the spot healing brush, adjust the brush down, just one or two spots around here. And what I've said a couple of times in the past sometimes, it's not a bad idea from time to time to zoom out because we get so close, you could say we're too close to the wood to see the trees. Control zero, that looks far better down there. I'm looking around now for any other little distractions that might draw my attention. A couple of stones there which are just catching the light. Okay, I'm going to turn my attention now to straightening up the image. So I'm going to try this content aware crop. I'm going to pick up the crop tool. I'm going to tick the box on the options at the top of the screen to select content aware and click into the bounding box to provide the rule of thirds grid. Now if I go just outside of my crop, I get the two linked arrows. That enables me to turn so that I can look to straighten this up. And I'm looking at the lines and the grids to straighten up the horizon along there. Now that looks, I think, about right. And now we're going to test that content aware crop by hitting the enter key. Pro probably going to take a few seconds to do this because Photoshop is going to attempt to fill in all of those bits on the edge. Now let's take just a second to have a look around. I think we could do with just having a tiny crop in from the edge but hasn't it done a magnificent job? Now sometimes when it comes to cropping tiny little areas like this in Photoshop, if you pick up the crop and click, as you move the crop in, it jumps in sometimes too far. So what you can do under those circumstances is to go to your view menu and just temporarily remove the tick in the snap command. Now that snap command works in our favour for most of the time, so remember to turn it back on. But if I zoom in, or yes, I will zoom in a little bit. If I zoom in to the top of this a bit more, you can see that now, if I wanted to come in at the top, I can come in just a tiny little amount. Control zero fits the image on screen. So if I wanted to take just a slither off the edge to lose any of the little tiny little white lines, I can do that. I can probably afford a little bit more on the bottom. And there you can see what I mean. And I think I will delete the crop pick, 
pixels because I don't need them anymore. Click OK. So there we've got the image straightened and we've also got everything tidied up around the image. Control 0 will fit the image on screen. Now looking carefully around the edge I have just spotted something which I didn't spot straight away so it looks like there is a little problem up at the top right there but I don't think it's anything that the spot healing brush cannot deal with. Let's test it. That's all. So have a good look around the edges where we use that content aware crop but we've got a little spot down there. I'd like to do just a little bit more burning now I can see the image in its entirety so I'm going to pick up my burn tool. I'm going to choose, I think I'll choose shadows. I want my exposure pretty low. I think I want it down to about 5% to start with. That'll do, 6. Just want to, no, it's a bit high. Take it down a bit more. Just wanted to take those tones down just a little bit over on the right. And a little more down the bottom there. And maybe even just see what I can do with the clouds, just a little bit more to those. I think it needs a bit more exposure for that. There you can see them just dropping down, not going too far, but just giving them a bit more power. And that's looking pretty good. Still not too happy with that right side. That's good. And one final thing perhaps is that little vignette, which I often do, although I've gone around the edge, I still usually just do that last little touch. I'm doing this pretty quick now, aren't I? So you can always add one selection to another. Control Shift I will inverse that. Select and mask. Feather around about 280. This is a not quite such a high resolution picture as I'm normally using from an older camera. Control H will hide that. Control L brings up the levels. Just a little touch on the edge just to bring it down. That's what we're trying to achieve. Subtle but worth it. Not forgetting of course to hit Control D to remove the selection and not forgetting in the view menu that I turn my snap off so before I forget I've turned it back on. So here I'm going to do one of my very unfair comparisons, but there's the image we started with. It doesn't look that impressive, but we do have all of the tones there that we need. We have all of the pixels and the information we need to produce a pretty stunning monochrome image. But perhaps we can even go one stage further. Let me shut this down and we'll go back to our monochrome. Over the years I've never been a great lover of third-party plugins to Photoshop which adjust images with monochrome or color. I always tend to think, oh, how do they know what image they're starting with? Because the end result with a third-party plugin like that has to have the greatest impact from the image you're beginning with. So, of course, if you haven't got a very good image to start with, adding a filter effect is not likely to improve it that much. But one of the sets of filters that I find myself becoming very warm towards is the Google Nick filters, which just happen to be free now. So if you haven't found these already, they're free online. Just Google it and you'll find them. Download and install them because they're well worth having. The way I use them is once I've got my monochrome as good as I think I can get it using the tools of Photoshop and Camera Raw, I then save it, which is what I've just done, so I've got my work saved and safe. But then I look at it in Google Nick monochrome filters and sometimes I find something a wee bit better. So let's take a look. So let me go to my filters menu and select the Nick collection. You can see there's quite a number here and we want the Silver FX Pro. Now the reason these filters are free is because they're not going to be supported anymore into the future. So in the fullness of time 
obviously the use of these filters is gradually going to diminish which is a great shame because they're superb filters but I'm sure there'll be something in their place by the time we get to that point. Now when the image opens on screen at the top here we get the neutral so to speak. This is the picture we've got in Photoshop and we get a number of presets down the side. We can look at them in groups, classic group, vintage, modern, or we can look at them all. I'm going to just highlight the top one. I'll use my down arrow to go down. Now that one instantly looks far too dark but if you look over on the right hand side these are presets on the left we can fine tune them on the right. I have to tell you most of the time I find a pretty good result on the left which rarely needs any adjustment on the right but they're good fun to play with and there's lots of changes you can make. There's the next option which is overexposed not too pleased with that and high contrast and high contrast smooth but now we get to one which I've used a few times it's called high structure harsh and to be able to see this in comparison to what we have in Photoshop just go to the top and click compare and look at the difference now I thought I got that image pretty well with a great spread of tones but as soon as I see that final little step applied by that high structure I like that but there's more go down to the next one this one's just a little stronger click the compare look at the difference in those two there's the one I created there's the one Google Nick produced I've still got all my sparkling whites and I've got some good rich blacks I'm gonna say thank you very much Google Nick I'm gonna have that I'm gonna click to open that up takes just a few seconds to apply the change and of course we would always save our original first but I think I'm pretty confident to say that I'm happy with that too but remember if you've got any doubt then back away from the filter you've just applied go back into Google Nick and maybe select the other one the one just above it save all three versions and you can look at those over the next few days and always the best one will soon make itself clear to you